So thank you all for spending your morning here with me. Uh, and thank you, Martin, for the kind introduction. Um, so I am heading up the data science team in Allianz. It's a German insurance company. And um, I'm very excited to be here um, to share with you a bit more about some of the use cases that we, we are doing at Allianz. So I think um, a bit of introduction about myself. I have spent um, over a decade in data across different industries. So I started out um, doing personalized medicine in NUS, so researching on how um, medicine actually affects the different cohorts uh, in Singapore itself. Um, then I went on to advertising, so looking at how we can manage um, sub, uh, publishers and advertisers in terms of what ads should we be serving to each customer. Um, then I went into insurance, and I went into insurance because I think insurance has uh, quite a reputation uh, in the market. So we all think that uh, insurers don't want us to claim, they're trying to charge us a lot, you know, they turn us away when we um, are very sick. Um, and, and that's something that I think it's caused by the inefficiencies of the market and the lack of transparency. And precisely because of digitalization and because of um, that data is available everywhere now, uh, it is a chance to move this reputation and start helping the insurance company serve, the cu serve customers better. So, um, if I can have a show of hands, uh, does anyone wake up feeling like that, like thinking very, very excited about life insurance? So you wake up thinking that you should buy life insurance and protect yourself. Every day. Every day. <laughs> yeah, so um, we actually went down to NUS also and did a, a, a study group with them and none of them have actually uh, this thought, right? They don't know insurance. Uh, they don't care about insurance. So that's, that's the kind of uh, um, thinking that we have, uh, especially in Singapore. And the, the insurance that comes in would be from my mom's friend or from my mom's friend's friend who has been a, a long time friend, um, who actually don't know, uh, we, so we don't know what we are buying, we just buy it for the sake of buying it. Yeah. So uh, for the next, I think I'll take probably like 30 minutes, um, I hope you, to share with you a bit more about what's going on in the insurance industry. Um, what are the disruptors that are coming out that's also forcing us to, you know, pick up our pace and start doing more around data and digitalization. How is Allianz uh, optimizing with data science? So I'll show you a bit of demo. So I understand it's a technical group, so um, a bit more in-depth case study on what we are doing right now. And then uh, the last part is very quickly on what's next, right? What's upcoming for insurance? All right, so the why. Why is it that uh, we see many insure tech companies coming out? So I'm not sure if you've heard of CXA. Um, it's just got this recent round of funding, $25 million, I believe. And um, many different uh, insure tech startups like PolicyPel who are all coming in to um, fix a part of the insurance chain. Right? That, and that's because um, the global insurance industry represents four trillion dollars in premium volume and that's a lot of money um, that's uh, waiting for these dis disruptors to come in because there is, uh, like I mentioned, still the gap in inefficiencies and lack of transparency that uh, requires a lot of work. So what does that mean for us? So this is Allianz. Um, we cover across private insurance, business insurance, asset management. We are 136 years old this year. We, we are the third largest financial institute around the world. Um, this is what we have. Uh, and this is also what we have, right? So we have many, many different uh, nimble startups which are coming in um, to take a piece of our pie. To say that you know there is a part of insurance that I can help out, there is um, we or maybe even e-commerce players or even logistics players like Grab. They recently went into a partnership with Zhongan to start offering insurance to the consumers. So how are we going to stay on top of this uh, for a 136 year old company? And for us, this means powering through data science, right? Um, this means that throughout the customer journey, we need to know more about the customers um, and be able to um, 
offer them the right products at the right time, offer them the right pricing and be able to know them better. So if you look at this picture, it's actually a very, very simplistic view of a, a customer journey uh, for insurance. Um, so you start here when you are a new um, customer where you haven't even bought a policy. And then uh, you go on and you buy more and more policies where you gain value or you actually drop off and you don't buy uh, policies with Allianz anymore. What we have done, um, so my team was set up about three years ago. Uh, I have about seven people in my team right now. And the mandate is to help Allianz entities around the region grow and use data science um, across their business value chain. And if you map it into uh, the customer journey, we have put together uh, different solution suites that we can actually help uh, different parts of the customers along the value chain. So the first part, um, as we move towards digitalization, as we know earlier from the poll, right, from the show of hands, nobody actually wakes up thinking, I want to buy an insurance. It all happens through our agents, and agents are the ones who are helping us be that front line, be that customer service to our customers. And hence, um, being able to help our agents grow, it's something that we, we are working very hard on. So, um, so we all know uh, the 80-20 rule that 80% of our business is actually uh, served by the 20% largest um, agents that we have. So the 20% most um, highly earning agents actually serves 80% of our customers. And so how do we find more agents who have the potential to help to drive the business? Uh, that's something that we looked at. So MDIT stands for Million Dollar Income Team. And that means that the top, 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 top agents uh, actually falls in this team. And um, what we do is to find potential agents who have the kinds of selling behavior and map it into the agents who are top and try to identify these agents with potential so that we can start to develop, develop them more. And on the other hand, when we look at agents, right, because a customer's relationship is the closest with agents, this means that when my agent le leaves, I'm very likely to leave with my agent. Otherwise, um, recently I have my agent uh, calling me to say that he's actually a new agent because my previous agent has left, but my previous agent has only contacted me like two weeks ago because my previous, previous agent has just left. So all these um, inconsistencies in agents handling customers provides very bad customer experience for our customers and it is one of the reasons why our customers would choose to leave us as well. So we actually look at the attrition of agents, so looking at their selling behaviour, predicting forward, how is it that uh, this agent behaved before he actually leaves and trying to predict on a new set of agents or our current set of agents, are they also exhibiting this same kinds of behaviour um, to identify agents who are likely to leave. And if they're likely to leave, then we would go in and say, um, you know, is there something that we can help you with? And you know, are you not happy with Allianz? Let's, let's do something about it. And in that way, we actually get some consistency in the agents that are serving our customers. So smart pricing, um, it's intuitive. It's more uh, on the pricing side where we make use of the data of the customers to try and price it um, granularly. So one of the things that we are doing in Malaysia Live is um, so I'm sure all of you are too young for that, but in a lot of cases, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, the, the three highs, high BMI, then you'll probably be turned away by an insurance company. We would say, no, you cannot be insured because you are at high risk of a disease. But in Malaysia Life, we have actually um, recently launched the 3H product. We can, we can actually price um, this customer's at the right price so that you will not be turned away by an insurance company. So you can still be insured, but we have to acknowledge that you're at the high risk. So we would have to price you higher. And then um, the second part is on uh, contacting. Uh, so it's making our current customers happier. So it's about finding the right time, uh, selling the right product, um, knowing what to sell to the customers at, uh, when they need it. Um, there is one that's pretty interesting. So Smart Health, it's quite a new project. Um, what we are doing here is trying to help our customers um, have preventive measures against chronic diseases. So 
uh, for chronic disease to happen, a series of diseases would have to happen or a series of different incidents would have to happen before the onset of, let's say, diabetes. So some, some things that uh, HPP is already doing are things like you know, cutting down sugar intake because I know if you consistently take sugar at this level, then the risk of you getting diabetes um, at the age of 40 years old could be very high. Right. So this is something that we are doing, looking at the claims behavior of our customers trying to tell them beforehand that you know you are you may be at high risk of getting a chronic disease so let's work together to bring down this risk and if you um, choose to work with us and you are you you want good for yourself as well then then we can bring down the pricing and that's where we can um, make it more affordable for you and on the other hand uh, if we see that customers are consistently exhibiting bad behavior then that's where we have to come in and say you know um, this is not something that we want to take, uh, then um, we would have to work out with the customers on the next steps. And then on the, the other side, it's more on the risk management. So for insurance company, risk is a very big thing. Uh, that's where uh, we actually have uh, uh, be able to manage our books and be able to um, assess what are the kinds of customers that we should be looking out for. Um, for this tree, I will go into deeper demos uh, in a bit. So I just want to quickly zoom out. Um, this is how we have actually structured data science solutions in Allianz. So we have actually um, templates where we can go around the region to help uh, different countries actually build up their data science solutions. Um, so because in Allianz, uh, Asia Pacific, we take care of 11 different markets around the region. And this means that uh, in Malaysia, there are two different companies. There in Indonesia, there, there's life in general in, in Thailand and so on and so forth. So to make it scalable, that's what we have done. Um, insurance data, it's almost about the same everywhere. So putting together data templates to enable our counterparts to be able to find the correct data uh, more efficiently. And then building out model templates where we can actually um, plug in this data and uh, reuse some of the knowledge and experience that we have and then uh, the output file where we actually deploy within the markets themselves. So um, going on to the exciting parts, um, the use cases of what we have done. So the first one is predictive underwriting. So for people who have taken up life insurance or health insurance before, you would know that usually you have to fill in a series of questions. So then the questions would ask you, um, have you had diabetes before? Do you have high blood pressure? So on and so forth. A lot of questions will be asked. Um, so the, um, in a lot of cases, some people may feel that, you know, if I say yes for anything, then um, I would probably be sent to the doctor and my policy uh, may not be approved. And for an insurance company, that is not the most ideal case. So there are many, many barriers that are set in place so that um, customers do, do not um, do, uh, disclose everything that they have. Right? So we want to try and get the customers to be as honest as possible. And that's why there are so many questions and so, so many steps involved. So on both sides, it's, it's a lose-lose situation. right? For the customers, you have to go through a lot of hurdles. For the insurance companies, you have to be very wary of this happening. And hence, um, we have built a predictive underwriting model that allows us to improve the straight-through processing rate. So uh, being able to capture the risk better means that we are able to let more customers um, get their policies approved faster. Right? So on one hand, we are trying to let people with low risk go through as quick as possible. On the other hand, we are managing our bottom line and make sure that we are capturing risk as much as possible. So for this case, um, we have deployed in Malaysia Live. Um, so what we have seen is that of the people that we um, flag out, there are 23% of them who have really non-disclosure. So what that means is, so I mentioned earlier that um, there are people who do not disclose on their policy submissions what kinds of conditions they have. Um, so how do we know when a person don't declare um, that this person is actually not declaring. 
right? So in a data science context means where do we get the labels from? How do we tell that this person is actually uh, not disclosing what their condi current conditions are? So we actually worked with the underwriters to have a proxy for this and say that you know, if you claim for a chronic disease, so chronic diseases are diseases that actually happen over a very long time. So if you claim for a chronic disease within two years of you applying for a policy, this means that there is a red flag for us to say that hey, by, at the time of your policy submission, you should have a kind of indication. Something must be happening um, that, that you know that you know there could potentially be something wrong but yet you are not telling us that. So these are just uh, probabilistic, right? So we are looking at how um, likely this person is going to not tell us. And hence using that as a label, we train this model. How we test it is instead of waiting two years for the customers to come back and claim, we send people who do not disclose anything to um, medical review. So we send them to the doctors and let the doctors take a, take a look at them. And out of these people that we send, 23% of them actually come back with um, things that they did not disclose in their policy submission. So the doctor comes back and says it could be small things like um, their BMI is actually 35, but they reported as 25, something like that. There is one very serious case that um, the customer actually had an, a leg operation and he, he's, he wasn't work, walking quite properly. Um, that was uh, um, returned in the doctor's report, but that was actually not flagged by the agent itself. So things like that are what we are trying to prevent for agents to actually teach their customers that you know um, you should not be disclosing anything or that for customers to think it's the easy way out. Um, so having this in place, we are able to maintain our um, the risk that we are taking. And on the other hand, for customers whom we think you know you have very low risk, then we just um, let you go through straight through. That means there's no checks, you just get your policy approved the next day. So then the question came, right? What if I just send randomly 10 people to the doctor? Would there actually be such findings? So 10 people that's not flagged by the model, we send it to the model, uh, to the doctor. Will the doctor also find uh, things of these customers? And so we shut down the model and we realized that, you know, there is a 25.9% um, incre increased in accuracy as compared to random sampling. So I think um, for the application of this model, the challenges lies in more of the business side. Um, so lacking of real labels is one. Um, the other one is also if I am an agent and my customer does not report anything in the application, then how do I tell the, the customer that I need to send him to the doctors. How do I tell this customer that, you know, this is, even though you are clean, you still need to go, a see, go and see a doctor. So that's where um, we had a very long discussion. So uh, in reality, as much as it sounds beautiful that, you know, we got all this result, in reality, the deployment was very, very challenging. And that was a takeaway for, for us also, that, you know, close, very, very close contact with business and consistently iterating with the business on how the solution can help them is actually very important from the start of the project. So what we did eventually, so um, initially we built a neural network, uh, neural network model, right? So it's got great accuracy. We went back and they asked us, why is it that this customer is being flagged? And we couldn't give them an, a result, uh, an answer or an explanation where they can bring to the agents or the customers to say, you know, uh, this is something that we flagged and hence it's something that um, it's a, it, it, it means that you need to go see the doctor. And hence, we went back to the drawing board and we built uh, a decision tree model instead. So as simple as it sounds, um, the, the way to explain data science to business is a very big, um, it's, it's top of mind for me right now that you know, we are able to open up the black box for data science and uh, bring it to the business so that they are able to apply it to, to the business itself. Okay, then the second part um, is on health claims anomaly detection. So what we did over here uh, is for health claims, um, whenever it's assessed right now, is that when you submit a claim, the claims assessors will actually look through your claims and see, okay, if you have dengue and you, are, you went for this kind of treatment, 
this is the kind of cost you should be expecting. But if the claim comes in and it's 200% of what the cost is supposed to be, then I'm going to say this is a fraud case and I'm going to stop these claims from going on. But you know, if you, I, I'm, I'm sure you are not, but if you're a good fraudster, you would know that you, know, you, you want to do just enough to fly below the radar. So you probably will not claim 200% of the, the amount. You'll probably claim like 120% or even 110% of what's, um, what the actual amount is. And hence, um, this is, uh, uh, we, we looked at it in a different way to say that the different actors that are involved if we aggregate up the claims, are there patterns that we can actually draw from it? So because claims fraud is very, 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 very difficult to, uh, to prove, there are also no labels for us in this case. And hence, we did a clustering method uh, on agents and agencies and hospitals and doctors to try and find abnormally behaving um, agents and so on, um, so that we are able to look deeper into these agents. As a result, uh, let me show you this. This is um, a dashboard that we um, have for the team. So as I mentioned earlier, right, breaking down the black box into something that the business can actually use. Uh, this is one of our attempts. So with claims fraud, um, once we point out that an agent is abnormal, then the business will come back and ask why is this agent abnormal. And so this is one of the dashboards that we have for them. Um, one means the agent is very, very abnormal. So we rank all the agents in terms of abnormality score um, on, on this scale. And every month we refresh the dash dashboard so uh, you would see down here that the first agent uh, 160146 is very, the most abnormal and so on and so forth. So there are two uses for this, right? One is that if there is a new agent who is showing abnormal behavior, then this is where the business need to come in and say, uh, these are the agents that we need to take a look at and uh, we probably need to keep an eye on this person. And the other hand, once the agency leader goes back to this agent and say, you know, we, we are seeing that you know, you're not behaving properly, we need to be able to track whether or not this agent is becoming better. Right? So then you would be able to see, for example, this second agent over here, uh, he was one before and then he became 20, 17. So we see good behavior happening, but we also see that hey, maybe he's going to go back to his bad behavior again. Right. So it is also a monitoring dashboard for the business themselves. And then the bottom part is the why. So we have actually built this uh, spider chart so that they can very quickly see um, on what uh, variables are we flagging this agent on. And there are claims variables, there are uh, policy variables that we have put in um, working together with the business again. And the different um, key factors of this agent. So then they are also able to drill down for this agent uh, into the specific details of the claims and uh, the policy information. So this um, is a different approach to opening up the black box for the business so that they have the explaining factors for them to go back to the agents and you know, work with them on becoming better. So to my last case study, it's on motto claims. So we serve both the live side as well as the non-live side. So on motto claims, um, the hypothesis is this, right? That when, uh, if you do drive, if you get into an accident, I'm not sure which garage you go to, but there are some garages that we see will tell you that, you know, since you're claiming insurance, why don't you also repair your boots? even if it's not spoiled, right? Since you're claiming insurance, why don't you also change this part of your car or repair that part of your car? And to an insurance company, it's bad behavior from the garage and it's also, um, it's also money loss for us. And so um, what we are doing here is that working with the claims assessors right now, we build up the network of a car 
So based on the car parts, we actually try to mimic the structure of the car. Um, there is no um, industry standard of car parts right now. So different models, different make and model of the cars actually have different car parts labeling and they have very, very bad naming convention for different cars, right? So um, this means that the challenge comes in when you want to replicate the structure of a car. Uh, currently, it's based on our assessor's experience. So the more experienced you are, the more you would know uh, this part should not have been claimed with this part or this part is suspicions, uh, it's, it's not right, right? So how do we actually replicate this kind of information from our claims history, from our assessor's experience? And this is something that we have done. Okay, I've lost my mouse. Okay. So um, this is the dashboard that we've done for the claim successors. So the claim successors will come in here every morning. They'll log into the portal. Is it working? But um, let's see. Yeah, I think it's good now. All right, so after you're authenticated, um, this is um, a mock up dashboard that we did. Um, so the assessors can actually look through the claims that they have over here and um, look at what are the claims that they need to assess. So at the bottom over here is the graphical network that we have done for the car and it's built from historical records of claims. Um, so how this works is every node actually represents a car part. It's in Thai because we built it for the Thailand market. Um, and the size of the node represents the severity of uh, the car part that's been claimed. Right, so um, if you think about it logically, the bigger the the point of accident should have the most severe damage reported, and hence we use that logic and we de um, detect the part that has got the higher severity and put it as the point of collision, and. Also logically, if you think about it, uh, at the point of collision, the severity should start decreasing as the, uh, as the car parts move away from the point of collision. And so if you look at the size of the bubbles, it, of the nodes, it actually represents the severity of each of these car parts. And so it should get smaller and smaller. But in this case, there are three nodes, uh, two nodes, that are actually reported to be more severe than the car parts before. And hence, we have flagged it out as, severe, uh, as suspicious parts that the plain successors should be looking at. And then there are two other nodes that are actually not linked to the rest of the nodes. And these are the car parts that we say um, should not be related to this claim and ask the claim assessors to take a closer look to. And then, um, so, as we know, a machine learning model is never accurate, so as much as we want it to be accurate, it will not be 100%. But uh, that's where we actually bring in the feedback loop at the bottom, where the claim successors can actually start telling us, you know, which are the, what does he or she think about this claim that we have flagged out? Is it normal? Does he or she agree that it's an upsell in parts and severity? 
and also any information that they can give us to make our model better. So this is the part where we build in the feedback loop on whether or not um, this uh, flag is actually true. And then, so um, on the last part, on what's next for insurance. Um, so as we have worked on a lot of solutions for the current business as usual insurance, right? So we are talking about how do we optimize operations? How do we reach the customers at the right time? But the data that we actually get from our current customers is very far and few. So if you think about life insurance, right? the most contact you would have with your agent hopefully is just one time at your point of policy submission and then you'll probably never contact your agent until touch wood something bad happens and so our knowledge of these customers it's uh, very far and few and also if you think about the the kinds of customer journey that goes through um, you will not wake up thinking of insurance you would not just go into insurance um, website and browse insurance products you will not download an app to buy insurance. These are the kinds of behavior that we are exhibiting these days. And so how do we actually um, start to educate the public on uh, the importance of insurance? And how do we actually make use of the different touch points to be embedded within the customer journeys? And so the Alliance have actually set up a different digital business arm where we actually look at digital businesses um, in the form of embedding in, uh, in embedding in e-commerce journeys or is it embedding in logistics journeys so working with different partners to reach the customers at the right time so when you buy a travel insurance uh, uh, travel uh, let's say air ticket for example and we know that you actually need a travel insurance that goes with it then is that the right time to actually um, bring it to you at the top of your mind so these are things that we are working on in order to be closer to the customers, in order to provide better service to the customers, and in order to um, know our customers better. And um, with that, I actually end my session today. Um, thank you all very much for taking time to sit here and listen to me. I hope it, it's helpful and uh, I'd like to stay connected with you all. Um, I also have a plug, so I understand this group has got a lot of talent. So uh, I have um, a friend who is um, the CTO at Golden Equator. So it's a, it's a venture capitalist fund and they're, they're actually looking for Python developers to help them work on search engines and be able to help their businesses better. So if anyone is looking for um, opportunity in, in, in financials, you can uh, come talk to me later. Okay. Thank you.